thank you so much, um, Chair, for your kind remarks and for allowing me to participate in this conversation. And certainly, thank you uh, to ODI for what I thought was uh, a very, uh, very instructive research, very instru instructive research, very instructive findings. My first reaction to the report was actually one of shock. One of shock that something like this is allowed to happen. Because if you look at what MoneyGram is, you know, the money transfer companies are doing, and you add on the cost of finance in our financial institutions in Africa, in terms of cost of finance on the African continent, then the combination of these two actually uh, end up doing what you would call uh, holding the African poor into a state of perpetual poverty because there is nowhere to turn. Fact is, and I agree with the ODI, remittances are a very critical source of livelihood for our families, but also very critical for our economies, especially because they are more, resili more, more resilient and more predictable than ODA, and because they help us, particularly in uh, uh, meeting our external financing obligations and therefore helping us reduce our current account deficits. There are over 30 million Africans in the diaspora. They contribute from what you have said, over $32 billion, even though the figure, there is no agreement on the actual figure. Some figures are higher than what you're giving us. So, you know, you know uh, safe, safe to say that uh, the figures are significant and they impact positively on the lives of our people. But is it acceptable that 1.8 billion should be going to two or three or whatever companies <coughs> by overcharging for services they are rendering to the continent? I don't think that that is true. If you look at the impact of the remittances, we're talking about 14 million kids that could go to school. But African families on average are about four or five people. The 30 million Africans outside that are, you know, are sending remittances to the African continent are actually impacting, if you assume that they are impacting a similar number of households, that is about 150 million people that are being touched positively by the remittances that are going. Is it <laughs> right? Is it fair? And is it responsible capitalism that the ability of the fellows that come to work in order they may help people back home can actually surrender that capacity to simply the imperfections of the marketplace? Mm. I don't think that, that is right. If you look at most of the remittances, the literature that we have shows that about 30 to 40% of the remittances that go into Africa go to rural areas. In essence, the money goes to help the people that are most needy. And you are allowing a multinational corporation to take bread out of hungry children. That is not what I call responsible capitalism. I think it is absolutely irresponsible. And I think something needs to, you know, to be done to fix it. In the case of Rwanda, we have seen the impact of remittances on our economy. And it has been growing. In 2008, we are getting, we are a small economy. We have a very limited, you know, external diaspora, maybe about 250, 300 out. But we've been getting, in the 2008, we got remittances of about 42 million. This figure rose to about 130 million, 130 million to 210, and it rose to about 172 million in 2012. Now, that may look like it is small, but actually, that figure is nearly double 
the revenue we generate from agricultural exports. We grow coffee, we export coffee, we grow tea, we export tea, we, we grow pyrethrum, and we export pyrethrum. But the combined revenue out of these exports in 2012 was only 104 million, while the remittances were about 172 million. The impact of those remittances on our economy is significant. And it is money that goes directly to, to help the poor. And uh, uh, the, the, the idea that uh, nearly 18% of that money that is being sent is going to Manigua, not because they are really selling a service, no, because they have seen a window through which they can squeeze and justifiably and take resources that they don't desire. Because I thought that uh, capitalism, the free market, was about fairness and equity in you being able to sell a service and getting sufficient revenue for it. Okay? It's no longer the case. We are allowing the marketplace to become, what do you call it? Some kind of cartel. Uh, and, and, and I think it is uh, absolutely distressing. Uh, you know, for, for, for us to sit here and we know that this is going on. And I am excited mm -hmm. that uh, people like, uh, you know, uh, the professionals at ODA are saying, you know, you know, flushing and saying there is a mess out there. I'm only hoping that we'll find the willpower to go out and say, rather to say, let's go out and fix it. And I agree with the recommendations, the, you know, the, the recommendation, recommendations that they, they, they have drawn. The monopoly is wrong. I don't believe that... Uh, the 1.8 billion is fair. I don't think it is just. And we need to advocate for an environment that allows for fair trade in goods and services, including money transfers. <coughs> uh, with regard to you talking about monopoly in our markets, <coughs> you know, in Rwanda, you, you saw uh, about 79, we have, uh, we have uh, Western Union, we have MoneyGram, we have about 18 other small operators, but you know, Western Union controls 78, rather 79 outlets across the country, while Western Union, rather MoneyGram has only three, and you have about 18 other small units. But a lot of the money is moved by Western Union. And the charges from UK, from UK to Rwanda, is actually not, uh, it's not 12% uh, as you, you, you're showing. I think, it, you know, from our experience, it's close to about 18, 19%. And uh, for you to be able to see uh, funds like those uh, uh, or rates like those being applied on one country because they charge, you know, transfers it to, to, to Rwanda coming at about 18%, but the ones to Uganda, I think, won't go in at about 11 or 12. And we are neighbors. And then you ask yourself, OK, what is the game plan here? You know, wh what is the basis for this irrational decision? Um, but of course, let's not uh, you know, beat up MoneyGram and, uh, and Western Union, because some of our institutions, for example, if you look at transactions within Africa, from a, for example, from South Africa into Zambia, charges are at about 25%. From uh, South Africa into Malawi, charges are at about 22%. So there is, uh, there are serious imperfections in this industry that are putting poor people to a disadvantage. And I think it is, you know, refreshing that we we see uh, experts in ODI and in London saying, let's look for a way to fix it. And. Uh, uh, so, you know, you, you were talking about uh, our banking system, you know, being mortgaged to ODI, rather to, to not to ODI. I, I wish. To, 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 to Western Union, to MoneyGram, uh, in these exclusivity agreements. And uh, I was, uh, you know, I was reading, you know, some of the literature in this area where it says that one of the reasons that we are mortgaged to these two, two companies is actually because uh, 
of lack of information about the existence of other players within the industry on the African continent. There are over 100 different companies on the African continent that actually transfer money. But we have decided that we are going to work with only these two, perhaps because they are the ones that can meet the Western criteria on the due diligence, okay, for purposes of money laundering and for anti-terrorism. So essentially, the only, your only oversight requirements that you're putting on your own institutions are creating a window that is allowing Western institutions to take bread from the mouth mm -hmm. of African children. And we need to make sure that uh, we manage it to ensure that uh, uh, even other organizations on the African continent that are, are in this business can be allowed to operate from your, your own market, which isn't <coughs> happening because I think even in London, there is an ongoing, you know, I think campaign to close some of the money laundering, rather the money transfer companies that are not part of uh, what you would call the MoneyGram Western Union class. And that creates a problem. You create a monopoly in London, by extension you create a monopoly in Bakken mm -hmm. Okay, You need to open the market here, okay, and you need to, to turn down your levels of oversight over some of these operations. And not create a situation where only the big guys are the ones that can actually operate honest business. Which is, which is a problem. I also would like to, to support the recommendations that you're making, particularly with regard to uh, improving the regulatory environment. I think we need to liberalize the market. I think we need to eliminate exclusivity. And I think we need to find a way of putting a cap on charges so that upfront there is predictability of what the people in Africa have to pay for a service. The other thing that I also agree with is the issue of use of mobile technology to move. In other words, diversify okay, the various channels through which we can get money to the people. Uh, much of uh, rural Africa does not have what you would call a fully built financial infrastructure. But almost all of Africa now, all, all, all of Africa now is on mobile. Yeah. So how do we use this, okay, as a way of scaling up access, as well as, you know, cutting down the cost of transaction, transaction <laughs> costs with the, with regard to money transfer. So that is an area I think that we need to encourage. But there is something else that I would like to challenge you to think about, which might be very strange. But I was thinking about it as I was coming. One of the things that uh, Western companies demand from our governments when they come to invest in Rwanda or in Kenya or in South Africa are the famous investment protection treaties. Okay? You require double taxation agreements to allow to ensure that the companies that come into our economies do not pay high taxes, or if they pay high taxes, then when the money goes, returns back, you do not tax them. We need to find a way. You see, the West exports capital into our, into our economies. We export feet. We export people. Okay? That is our investment into your economies. How can we make sure that what they get out of your economies by way of salary earnings is sheltered from your high taxation so that they can have something to take back home. <laughs> no, seriously, because if, you, if, you, if Coca Cola comes to Rwanda and negotiates a tax deal, if I have a thousand Rwandis in the UK, I need to be able to see whether these fellows, the money they get, can also get some kind of relief. And, and I, I'm not saying this because I want the West to help Africa. I'm looking for a case of equity in the relationship. You get concessions from us because you are exporting your assets into our economies. Our assets are our people. How do we get a fair deal on what we push into your markets? Because they come here because you need them. So how can we find a way 
I'm right now I'm thinking aloud. I don't know how to handle it, but I think it is something that we need to think about. And I believe, I believe that one of the things that are going to drive Africa's transformation is Africa's ability to invest in its own productive sector. That to happen, we need to increase our levels of savings. And I believe that if, for example, I'm just thinking aloud, if the people in their diaspora were given a, task, a, a tax concession on part of their wages, particularly the component that is transferred in the remittances back to Africa, that would increase the volume of funds that would be going back. And instead of the money going to perform med medicine because you have been able to send two dollars instead of one and a half, then you have a half a dollar to save that would help in increasing the liquidity within our system, which would then be used to fund productive industry, to expand our economies, create greater opportunities for our people, and stop the migration that the West is terrified of. Stop creating the attractiveness in, in Western capitals for our youth because greater investments driven, not by aid, but by a concession on the assets that we give allows us to save more, to invest in expanding our economy, creating greater opportunities in our markets, and stopping the flow of people into Western economies. I thank you.